1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today is going to come from the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to be continuing our series there. And this is, it doesn't require a whole lot of introduction, but suffice it to say, just to get you caught up, at this point, Saul has already been pretty well established as the king of Israel. There's really not a whole lot of dispute left as to whether or not he's the real true king. And so we see this episode unfold in chapter 12 of 1 Samuel, verses 1 through 5. Then Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I have listened to your voice and all that you said to me, and I have appointed a king over you. Now here is the king walking before you, but I am old and gray. And behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked before you from my youth even to this day. Here I am, bear witness against me before the Lord and his anointed, whose ox I have taken, or whose donkey I have taken, or whom I have defa defrauded, whom I have oppressed, or from whose hand I have taken a bride to bind, blind my eyes with. I will... Sorry, I'm going to start that part over. Whom I have oppressed or whose hand I have taken a bribe to blind my eyes with, I will restore it to you. They said, you have not defrauded us or oppressed us or taken anything from any man's hand. He said to them, the Lord is witness against you and his anointed is witness this day that you have found nothing in my hand. And they said, he is a witness. This is a really interesting little episode at the tail end of Samuel's life. He understands that it's not going to be real long before he passes from this world. And he's seen all kinds of things happen in Israel in his day. He has been the one to anoint Israel's very first king, he has been kind of the chief prophet and judge over Israel for a while before a king was put into place. His sons wound up betraying and, and taking bribes and doing all kinds of untoward things, but he never did. And so there's a, a couple of really big takeaways I want us to take from Samuel's little speech here. First of all, I think Samuel is very aware, and you can tell by the speech, he understands the inadequacy of self-reflection. Self-reflection is a great thing. I wish the world did a lot more self-reflection. I think we as a human race would be made significantly better if we did more self-reflection and thought to ourselves, man, am I doing the right thing here? Am I really living the way that I'm supposed to? Am I really relating to God the way that I should? That kind of thing. Self-reflection is incredibly important to the Christian ethos, and I'm not downplaying the importance of that. But Samuel realized that there are shortcomings to it. That sometimes your own self-reflection isn't enough. Part of the reason that God specifically always had his people, whether you're talking about the people of Israel or the people that came later in the form of Christianity, the reason that it was always really important to him to have them in communities as opposed to just off by themselves, is that self-reflection has blind spots. Sometimes, if it's something that you don't realize that you're doing wrong or something that you don't realize you're doing the correct way, you could be completely unaware of the fact that you're missing the mark there. And it takes a second person to come in and say, no, this is where you're falling short, this is where you did wrong, this is what needs to be corrected. And so Samuel comes before Israel and says, hey, look, I don't think I've done anything like this. I don't think that I've made any mistakes. I don't think that I've done anything wrong, at least in this one specific facet that he's talking about. I'm sure Samuel didn't think that he was mistake-free. Uh, I mean, the whole episode with his sons is a pretty clear indication of that. But he's saying, okay, is there anybody whose donkey or whose 
livestock I've taken when I shouldn't have? Is there anybody that I've defrauded or had some kind of, you know, taken a bribe or something like that? If there is anything that maybe I'm missing here, y'all let me know. And they all are looking around like, well, well no, Samuel, you, you've been a great priest. You've been a great prophet. You haven't taken any bribes. You haven't, you know, cheated somebody out of his livestock, trying to use the law as a cudgel to, to get what you wanted. You've not done any of that. Which I'm sure Samuel took as a massive relief. And as somebody who is a, a minister himself, I can tell you, like, even if you don't think you've done anything wrong, opening yourself up to that level of criticism to the people that you serve, that's nerve-wracking. I'm sure it was for Samuel, too. It wasn't an easy thing for him to do, but it showed his character. It showed that he cared enough about doing the right thing, about being God's servant and doing things the right way, that he was willing to open himself up to that criticism. And that's something that I think is sorely lacking in our society today. We don't want to be open to criticism. I know I've harped on this before, but I can't stand it when people say, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to cut all the toxic people out of my life. Nine times out of ten, what that means is, if anybody thinks I'm doing anything wrong, I'm going to get rid of those people. I'm going to have no communication with them from here on out. Well, there are some times where you do have to cut people off. There are some times where even the Bible describes that it's not wise to throw, cast your pearls before swine. And the Bible even recommends that if there is somebody that tempts you or puts you in evil company, that you don't need to be around those people. But that's not even what I'm talking about. Most people in today's society even with somebody that is well-intended and has their best interest at heart, they think even the minimum amount of criticism is enough reason to just cut that person out of their life completely. And Samuel, he's looking for criticism. He's going out there and saying, hey, if I've got some blind spots, somebody please tell me. Because he understands that he's human. He understands that he can't see the angle of everything perfectly, especially when he's looking through his own eyes. Self-reflection tends to give us a rosier view of ourselves than is probably realistic. And that's why it's so important to understand that something that the Bible prescribes over and over again is that sometimes judgment from other people is needed. A lot of people completely misunderstand the idea of judgment in the Scripture and say that, oh, Christians are supposed to never judge. No, in fact, we're supposed to seek out the counsel and judgment of other people our brothers in Christ, to try to figure out where we're missing the mark and how we can get better. That's something Samuel does here, and I commend him for it. But I think the secondary lesson that we can take from this is that the Bible, especially for people that are in positions of spiritual leadership, we see this a lot in Titus and First and Second Timothy because those are the pastoral epistles, the epistles that give us insight into what church leadership is supposed to look like, how it's supposed to function, that kind of thing. One of the phrases that gets used a lot when it refers to church leadership is to be above reproach. Now, this is something that all Christians are called to, but it's specifically harped on with people that are in leaderships of, uh, who are in positions of leadership when it comes to spirituality. Samuel understood this too even though this is long before those requirements were put in place, he understood that somebody that is acting as a representative of God on this side of eternity has to be somebody whose personal character needs to be above reproach. Doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. Doesn't mean you don't occasionally miss the mark. But when you do, you apologize, you forgive, uh, you ask for forgiveness, and you try to make it right. And that's what Samuel is trying to do here. He's saying, if I've screwed up anywhere, right here, right now, I'll make recompense. If I've taken a bribe or I've made some kind of misjudgment, I will make it right, right here. I will seek out reconciliation. I will take of whatever I have, and I'm going to make sure that it is made right and I have reconciled with whoever I have wronged. See, that's the other part of this, that to be effective as a representative of God, to be effective as a person that other people look to to try to figure out what God's like and, and who He is, you better make sure that you live a life above reproach. That even when people could point to your shortcomings or your 
inadequacies or idiosyncrasies, they say, yeah, but, but he works real hard at it. You know, like maybe he has a particular issue with this sin, but he is, he is doing his best to get over it. Or, you know, sometimes this guy has a tendency to be a little arrogant, but man, he, he really tries to tamp that down. And if you tell him, he, he apologizes for it right away, that kind of thing. Somebody whose character is above reproach, not a perfect person. But Samuel understood that for other people to, he didn't want to ever give somebody a reason to lose their faith in God because of a stupid mistake that he made. And he's saying, since, since I'm close to the end of my life, you already have a king in place, you already have other prophets in place that will take up the mantle when I'm gone, let me know now so I can make it right before my life ends. That's the kind of strong character, the desire to do the right thing, because a lot of people would probably rather, let me just ride this out until I die, and then I don't have to worry about it. He's saying, no, I want to go ahead and make a reconciliation right now to make sure that before I pass on, that people don't have a reason to have reproach against me, that I am right in the sight of God and man as much as I can be. And I think that that's the same standard that we're supposed to have as Christians. Yeah, there are always going to be people that don't like us. Yeah, there are always going to be people that complain about us. But we better make darn sure that we're doing the absolute best that we can to make sure that we also have a character that is above reproach. Because remember, when other people, especially if they know that you're a Christian, and if you are, then they should, they're going to be looking to you to figure out, what does a person that tries to live like Christ look like? And if they see a person that isn't above reproach, if they see a person that blatantly makes mistakes and doesn't care and doesn't seek out the counsel of other people and isn't humble enough to realize that, that maybe they're missing something, then they're going to get a very skewed vision of what Jesus Christ is actually like. That's something that should be a reminder and a motivator to all of us to live a life like Samuel that is above reproach. Stay the course, friends. <laughs> So now they have this fancy new technology where you click on one of these boxes and it takes you to another one of my videos. Hopefully it works a lot better than the Obamacare website or the DNC's Iowa caucus app. Gotta love that big government central planning.